Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. Onk Live Insights features in-depth reports, feature segments, and profiles of leaders in clinical medicine, providing expert perspectives in cancer care and emerging research. Patients undergoing uh, treatment for cancer and advanced cancer is uh, a very um, stressful time in their lives. It's, it can cause a lot of anxiety and depression, uh, thinking about your own mortality. The hand-foot skin reaction can occur fairly early on, I would say, um, but in re I really haven't had any significant additional toxicities. Obviously, I've seen some cases of thrombocytopenia with prolonged therapy, which would not be unusual, but I've really had no issues with increased liver function tests on any of my patients. Hello, I'm Joe Petrozello, Head of Clinical Affairs with OncLive.com. We recently sat down with some of the world's leading experts to gain their insights on the latest clinical advances in cancer care. In this Onc Live Insights video editorial series, we will review the latest advances in the clinical management of advanced colon cancer. So let's start by talking about treatment options in advanced CRC and what's your preferred regimen in the first line setting. So when I evaluate my patients, the first thing I, I decide are what are my objectives of, the, of their treatment. Do they have surgically resectable disease or is this purely for palliation, meaning that they're not a surgical resectable candidate and I need to consider my chemotherapy options? So if that's the case, one of my favorite regimens is actually the full fury bevacizumab based regimen. I just think full fury is tolerated quite well in that setting. But if you have a patient going on a surgical resection, the tendency is to utilize an oxaliplatin based treatment. I tend to always utilize an anti-VEGF therapy in the first line setting currently. Um, and I do not utilize an anti-EGFR therapy in the surgically resectable patient just because the data from the new EPOC trial came out last year which showed that actually that was detrimental to provide patients anti-EGFR therapy in a surgically resectable patient with liver metastasis. We do utilize, I think a large majority of people will continue to utilize an anti-VEGF therapy agent um, as a second line setting. Not that we don't um, approve of EGFR therapy um, in that setting as well. It's just that for a lot of patients, if they're surgically unresectable, when they hear of some of the toxicities that may be associated with anti-EGFR therapy, they have some concerns obviously with the rash and the potential for um, basically um, uh, swelling of the distal fingertips and perinechial infections. That concerns them because it's very cosmetically difficult for some patients. They're already dealing with cancer and yet here they are having to deal with their appearance and how to address these other side effects. Um, I, so I do like to utilize an anti-VEGF therapy um, usually in the second line setting, but I'm not a, unopposed to using, utilizing anti-EGFR therapy as well. And I do want to make sure we understand that I only use anti-EGFR therapy once I've tested the patient for the KRAS mutation to make sure it's not present. And at our institution, we do test all patients for all the rare RAS uh, mutations as well. So I only utilize it in the patient that's in all RAS wild type so patient So you did population. expanded testing in the exon? Yes. I'm exon very fortunate. Two, three, I have this institution that I, I can do that at my institution without having to send it out. So. Um, regarding therapy um, and toxicities, obviously for any anti-VEGF agent, we are always concerned about hypertension, which can occur in about 30 to 35 percent of patients. So I do follow their blood pressure closely, um, but that is obviously treatable. And, and you don't want to utilize an anti-VEGF therapy agent when you've had recent surgery within the past eight weeks. So I am very careful about the timing as well. Um, regarding um, toxicities associated with anti-EGFR therapy, um, we treat, um, when we provide the treatment to our patients, we give them a lot of counseling beforehand about some of the toxicities that can develop, and we make sure that they feel informed so they know how to be preemptive and utilize either the topical antibiotics that are available or oral antibiotics if it's fairly severe. Let's talk a little bit further about refractory disease. When do you incorporate agents like aflibercept or regorafenib? So aflibercept is currently only approved in the second line setting in combination with arinotecan based therapy. And I actually have used it um, in patients that maybe have had quick progression following anti-VEGF um, therapy in the frontline setting. So let's say I'm using bevacizumab in the frontline setting, the patient progresses very quickly let's say within the first two or three months, I would definitely want, want to consider some alternative options. So um, if I don't consider a clinical trial, I would consider pos possibly using a flibercept with a renatecan in that setting. And um, uh, regarding some of the other agents such as regorafenib, I presume that's what you're referring yep. to? 
Um, we basically, once again, always encourage clinical trials, if available, for enrollment. Um, but regorafenib, I believe, does have a role in, for patients, especially when they um, don't necessarily want to participate in a clinical trial or they, or they don't have access, especially. But in those patients that either they're a KRAS mutant and they only have anti-VEGF therapy available to them, so we ut we've utilized that already. Or um, for patients maybe that um, have gone through all the standard lines of therapy and once again don't have a clinical trial available, I will use regorafenib as a single agent. I try to utilize it in patients with a PS of zero to one. I really try not to give treatment to patients with poor performance status overall because I don't think those patients are going to fare well from that regimen.